first saw Sri the Prabhupada in 1966. His beginning days at the 26 Second Avenue, and uh, he impressed me like a Buddha figure. He was wearing just a, a bare chest and a top piece. And uh, I didn't know anything about Vedic gurus, but he looked like a Buddha. So, I, but I, I did know or had an attraction for Eastern uh, gurus. Fortunately, I never had any guru, but uh, so I, what I first saw was not him, but I saw a little piece of paper in the window that said yoga classes on Bhagavad Gita, transcendental sound vibration, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so by myself, I decided to go and see him. And uh, I was a loner. I came to him alone. Uh, some other groups, there's a Mott Street Boys, they came together. Uh, Umapati, Kirtanananda, and um, Hayagriva, yeah. And Prabhupada would also remember the past as, as the years went by. He would remember those early days. And he said, oh, you three came together. And then he would say to me, oh, but you came alone. And uh, so I went into the storefront alone one night to attend a, a class, and I was shy. But uh, one one of the young men turned to me, Ray Rama, his, his name was Raymond. He said, what's your name? I said, Steve. And uh, so he, was, he welcomed me. And then uh, he said, the Swami will be out in, in a few minutes. There was all straw mats on the floor. And a straw mat for the Swami, too. That's all he had, no chair. Then, so then he came out, and he wore white slipper, uh, slippers with pointy fronts to them, like ba bathing slippers. Um, I've never seen any slippers like that since then. He stepped out of those slippers, and they're like gen genie slippers, and... Uh, sat down on the straw mat, the exact same level as us, and uh, looked around, and then began uh, to chant, and uh, very slowly play with the cartels. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. We have some very early tapes of those vintage kirtans. So I was very impressed by the kirtan and, and by him personally. Um, I had trouble with his speech, but uh, still I was impressed by him. He was the first Indian teacher I came across, so um, the gravity uh, Gravity meaning uh, the silence and the seriousness, no nonsense appearance, uh, and the elder elderliness. Um, all these things I liked very much grandfatherliness. The first question I asked him was, uh, uh, he, he had a, a, a protocol of you could ask a question afterwards, so I, I asked, is there freedom from misery? And I asked him that because I had I had read it in a book by uh, uh, 
Van Gogh's letters to his brother, Dear Theo, and that he said there's no freedom from misery. Misery is eternal. And he said, uh, in, no, there's no freedom from misery. He said, you can break your arm and go to the hospital and come out, and then you'll break another limb. So there's no relief from misery. And even at the end of this body, you'll take another body. He said, but uh, there is relief if you get liberated uh, and not have to come back from the material world. That's the only way, way there's relief from misery, by this chanting of Hare Krishna. So that was my first question I had asked based on that reference I read. And then I asked a personal version of it up in his room alone when I was thinking of my own ha bad habits and my attempt to get relieved of them. I said, uh, Swamiji, I was a little more advanced than to talk to him alone, one to one. I said, is there a stage in advancement where you can uh, reach a point where you don't fall down again? And he said, yes. And that's, that's all he just said. And I was very, very pleased to hear that. And actually, um, personally, from the, fir from the first night I went in to, and saw him, I, I did break all my uh, habits or they went away by themselves. So that's, uh, he had that, he and the chanting had powerful effect on me. I had a thing that I wanted to uh, get special attention and I wouldn't go forward unless I was given it. Um, so I knew that he had Sunday morning feasts and I also knew that he had morning classes as well as the, he had morning classes every day and Monday, Wednesday and evening, Monday, Wednesday and Friday in the evening. But I didn't attend the morning classes because um, Nobody uh, invited me, and they had Sunday feasts, and nobody invited me, so I didn't go. Um, but then one day I was um, sitting, uh, after the lecture, I was sitting on the curb outside, and he, he waved me in, or he, somebody, he got somebody to bring me in, and he said, uh, you know, we have Sunday feasts. He said, would you, uh, would you like to come to the Sunday feast? I said, yes. He said, you can come too, you're invited. So I, I started going to them. And uh, then some of the other guys told me that they were, uh, I could go to the morning classes too. But I was very slow until, unless I was invited. And that's where that uh, exchange came up between us that I didn't go to the first initiation because nobody asked me to get initiated. Some, the first initiation was so lackadaisical that people went and got initiated without even seriously considering whether they were going to follow the four rules. But um, I, I didn't think I was ready to get initiated. I wanted to stay independent. Um, so the first initiation was on John Mustami, and I, did, I stayed home. But I was typing for him. So the day after John Mustami, I showed up at his door with uh, some typing that I had done. And he said, oh, you did not come for initiation yesterday. And I said, no, but I, I did some typing. I gave him the typing, and he gave me some grapes. And... Uh, then there was an exchange going on the, the telephone for a marriage that he was going to have arranged between Makunda and Janaki. And he hung up the phone and he said, you're invited to come to this marriage. You can come. And uh, I said, thank you. 
and I, I went to the marriage, and then I was de I was sorry that I had not gotten initiated, so I, I asked him another occasion, another day, could I come, could I get initiated on the next occasion? He said, well, you'll have to be a bit strict vegetarian. I said, oh, I really am. And uh, so he, he said, yes, then you can be initiated. And... Um, so uh, it was all, I was, uh, what, what, um, what I wanted to go back was when I brought, when I brought those papers um, and he saw this reluctance on my part not to get initiated, not to go to the morning class, not to go to the feast, unless I got, initi unless I got invited. Uh, it was like a defect on my part. So he said... Um, uh, important words to me. He said, um, um, I will love you if you will love me. So um, that was a big change in my part. He was exposing that I wasn't loving him, but I was expecting him to always be loving me. And I thought, I, why am I holding back my love for him? It's something I dislike about his face or his uh, way of talking or something. Uh, I'm not loving him, but I'm expecting him to pour all this love on me. So I just, uh, I looked at all the, the ugliness inside myself of why I might not be loving the Swami. And I decided that I should just kick it out. I should love him. And uh, and then he said, if you do that, then I'll love you. There's no, but it's a t it's a two way street. So that was a big uh, barrier. He exposed that. You more or less read your heart. And yeah, your mind. yeah. That would be a good life lesson. That uh, in in any relationship, certainly with the spiritual master or with any spiritual relationship, a husband and wife, or with anything, you have to love the other person in order if you want to be loved. Excellent. Excellent. So that, that, uh, that really broke a lot of ice, and uh, from then on, I didn't have to be so much invited to things. I, st I stepped forward more. He was uh, teaching from um, Dr. Radhakrishnan's Bhagavad Gita himself, and some of us went out and bought copies of it too. He said that the translation is 98% uh, good. Don't read the purport at all. It's, it's contaminating. But you can read, read the English out loud. We had classes, so he would say, Raymond, read... 8.7, read, read the translation, so that we would read the translation and consider it bona fide, that book. Um, and then we had his Srimad Bhagavatams. We didn't use them in any consecutive order. They were just there to read and, and, uh, and, and grasp. It's funny, we didn't studied the Srimad Bhagavatam, as I remember it. Uh, it's not that everyone had the money to buy them. I bought them. I remember asking about when you get initiated, is your karma stopped? And... Uh, he said, yes, it's like um, the fan, is in, the electric fan is rotating, but on, a, on initiation, the plug is pulled out, and it may take a little time to, that the rotations are going, but there's really no more karma. So questions like that, I'd ask them. I was upset, and with tears in my eyes, I went to him and said, my father said, if I 
continue to have anything to do with this movement. They won't have anything to do with me. And he saw me, my teary state. And he just look, looked, looked at me and he had a kind of twinkling eyes. His, his eyes were kind of twinkling. And uh, he was kind of saying, well, that's all right. So he was, uh, yeah, I know he's dealt with his students in different ways, told, encouraged them to keep up good relations with their parents. But with me, he didn't do that. He just kind of smiled and uh, more or less said, let it go. And then not long after that, I wrote him a letter. Are you my real father? He said, yes. Uh, the, the the other relationship is material and transitory. I am your real father. So I never had any problem with that. My only my only problem was to be careful, not to give extreme advice to to, to students in Krishna consciousness that my way was their way. Uh, I had to realize that relationships could be patched up. Uh, and uh, parents and and their and their children could come together in Krishna, Krishna consciousness, but I did tell them what happened to me and what happened to uh, Narada Muni. Then and you shouldn't waste too much time on it, and and don't go walking into the face of blasphemy every time you go home, and have it, you know, Prabhupada that. You know, that such and such Swami that, I mean, I couldn't stand that. Uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, uh, when he, he, he was close to his mother up until the end, but um, he had a habit of writing to his mother. And uh, when he became a sannyasi, he wondered if he should keep it up frequently. And Prabhupada said to him, do you wish to make a special? Do you wish to make your mother a special object of your mercy? And uh, so he was putting it to him, um, like uh, you know, there's a lot of people you have to save in this world and limited time. I'm not going to give you an order that uh, you should keep writing to your mother every week. You're a sannyasi now. Uh, if, if you do, however, want to make her a special object of your mercy, you can do that. And so he kind of put it as a burden on his shoulder to think about. And he stopped writing to her so often. But they did remain close. And like the Sunday feasts that he served, um, and it, with his bare feet just passing by, just like you might see nowadays in India, a boy serving you. So he, he would walk past the rows of the devotees with his lotus feet, serving out the portions to, to everyone, the, the portions that he had cooked and uh, was serving. And he asked me, do you, do you want uh, the pushpana rice or the regular rice? And I would take my choice, and then he would put the one on the, or the other on my plate. And then he would go back and get some other preparation and put it on each person's plate. At the same time we were allowing it, we were, I was thinking that his feet were very worshipable, but still we didn't jump up and say, no, no, don't you do it. I remember one time when um, I worked at the welfare office and they said I had to stay an hour late um, so that I couldn't meet, I couldn't go for lunch. Lunch was a real treat in his room with uh, about 12 devotees, and he sat amidst us, and 
so that meant I couldn't go that day. I wasn't initiated yet. I phoned his place and I got him on the phone. I said, Swamiji, this is Steve. Do you remember? Do you know who I am? He said, yes. I said, I can't come to lunch today. I have to stay in an extra hour to work. Could you save me a plate? He said, all right, I can. So I came there instead of uh, 12, I came there at 1. And everything was finished. The uh, every, Everyone was gone and the, the plates were, were washed and... Uh, he, what he used to have the the rug rolled back, um, so the, the rug was rolled back, but but there was one place there. He said, "Sit down," and I sat down, and then he brought out a plate and placed it down, and then he still st he stood there a moment while he put put the plate there, and then automatically. As the plate was there, I just I bowed down at his feet. So that was one time, maybe the first time I think I bowed down at his feet. He said yes. So gradually we... Then Gargamuni asked a question. He said, if I don't feel like bowing down when the others bow down, should I still do it? It's a famous question. What is it? Prabhupada said, yes, you should. Um, by bowing down, you'll feel like... By bowing down, you'll feel like <laughs> doing it. Oh, so, yeah. So how it became like a more established thing, I, I can't quite remember. Mm -hmm. Um... Kirtanananda's going to India with Prabhupada had something to do with it when he came back. Um, I know, remember some boys really getting rebellious when when it really started, and and they're quitting. They didn't like it. I remember that we I, we interviewed one fellow for the Prabhupada Lamrida, and he said. When, when that bowing down started, he said, I knew I had to get out of here. He said, I, I didn't want any part of this. A movement was bowing down before the guru. So it was it was noticed as a big difference. People would say, and at, at programs, people would ask that question, too. Why is everyone bowing down to you? Uh, an outsider would say, and Prabhupada would say there's some different things. They are wondering why you are not bowing down. <laughs> you must then, there's a, an extended one, you must bow down to someone. Everyone has to bow down to someone. Why? I, I, don't, I don't bow down to anyone. Oh, yes, you do. Then Prabhupada would say, do you bow down to old age? You bow, no, I don't. Yes, you do. But you, so you must bow down to someone. Why not bow down to a guru, an advanced person? It was stubborn persons. They couldn't get the idea that if they bow down to the right person, they would not have to bow down to all this birth, death, disease, and old age. He, he gave me some uh, business instructions. Um, chastised me. One day, in, uh, I was in, in Mayapur, and he sent me to Calcutta to do something in the bank. And uh, they, they wouldn't give me what I asked for. So um, I forget what it was, but I couldn't get it done. So... I came back, uh, having failed to get it. So he said, "You, you've what you failed to do is you should have got gotten them to write down in paper why they refused to uh, do what you asked them to do." He said, "So now we have nothing." He said, "You, you're a complete f a failure." He said, "If you had gotten them to write down it." 
why this man uh, wouldn't uh, get it uh, for you or why his supervisor wouldn't give it for you. Then we would have had something. So I thought how smart that was of him to uh, get something. You know, if you get refused, at least get in writing why you were refused. That was a sort of like Indian smart business thinking that a naive American kid didn't think of. I just got turned away into the street with nothing. If I had a piece of paper, it would have been at least the, uh, the start of uh, upper investigations. That happened to me once before, too, in Indian dealings. At least get something written down. <laughs> he put me into tears sometimes, though. Um, and th then he put me into tears and waited for me to come out with a solution. Uh, not just sit there and cry. There was a time when I, oh, I, I sent a letter out. And the, and the letter then, when it came to uh, him examining the letter, it said, uh, I have enclosed, it was a letter to Guru Das, I have enclosed the uh, specimen of, uh, of the letter to so-and-so. I forget what it was, but it wasn't there. He said, why did you say you have enclosed the such-and-such -such when it's not there? I said... <laughs> Well, I looked for it in my files, and the, the files are they're, they're in not in good order now. I have so many things to do. I'm editing back to Godhead, and I'm still GBC of my zone. And I just got here, and I'm cooking for you. And it's and I just like I started to gush out. I just got, I'm so overloaded, and I have to cook, and nobody's helping me. And uh, Pradumna was supposed to help me cook, and nobody's helping me do anything. And he said, you know, that's not the point. Why did you write in this letter that something's there and it's not there? And I, then I started to cry. And then I really started to cry, and I said, I guess it means because I don't, I don't um, love you enough or something like that. I was like really going for what was really the real reason that I didn't do the thing right. He's, so he just sat there and he waited, waited for me to, 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 to come up with something more than that. That wasn't good enough. That was just a sentiment. And then I said, I was just a crying mess, like a woman or something. And I said, I'll write him another letter and tell him that that this letter was written wrong and then I'll find the I'll find the paper. I'll find the other paper. Do it, he said. <laughs> then I was dismissed and I had to find that other paper but to just leave him saying the paper is enclosed and it's not enclosed. So then I wrote him another letter and said why it wasn't enclosed. And I finally searched and found it. So he could crush me certainly easily. I was cutting some uh, cucumbers, and he said, uh, "Don't cut it that way." I was you know, I was cutting it this way. He says, "Cut it that way." He said, you'll, you'll never get it right. He says, not in 300 years. I said, no, no I won't. I'll, get, I'll learn to get it right. He said, no, you won't. He, and he's like, and, and I, I talked back, you know. I thought, I, no, don't say that. And he said, no, you won't. You'll never learn, not in 300 years. I was just like, 
I just talk back. I didn't put any ginger on his breakfast plate. And he said, uh, there's no ginger on the plate. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. Just just like did an imitation of my insincerity. In the, in the, with the sarcasms of like just Im imitating my insincerity. I really could crush me. So it wouldn't take much, just a little inflection. And he had some names for me. He called me Dr. Uh, Isaac Newton because I was uh, so impractical. He said that Dr. Isaac Newton was, uh, um, although he was very brilliant, he he was very impractical. He had a he had a friend, and the friend saw that Dr. Isaac Newton was b building two holes in it, in his door. He said, why are you doing that? He said, I'm doing that to let my uh, cats in the, uh, allow them to come in and out of the house. And I have one big cat and one small cat. His friend said, well, why don't you just build one hole and they both can come in and out of that hole? So he said, just, just see, Dr. Isaac Newton was supposed to be a great scientist, but he was so, such a fool. Um, so he was, this was just an, an anecdote he told. And then, so then he, he said, so you, you, you students are like that. And then, uh, then he, he called me, like, we, we went to the Hawaii beach side and, uh, we all got out of the car and, and boom, locked the car doors. And uh, I left my bead bag in, in the car. And I said, oh, I left my beads in the car. And he just walked off walking. He said, Dr. Isaac Newton. <laughs> so that was a, a nickname for me. And I didn't know whether to take it as a good name that showed that I was a brilliant man. Or that I was just a complete fool. <laughs> he said, he wrote a letter, he said, uh, um, I keep you, you are not a good manager, but I keep you on the GBC because you always do what I say. So, um, well, you are you are a perfect gentleman. Oh, oh, some this was this was told uh, to me. It wasn't written down, but when there was some corruption in New York City management, Polly Mardon and this woman and everything, uh, Gopal Gopal Krishna suggested maybe I could become the person in charge. Prabhupada said no. He said Sasvarupa. Is a perfect gentleman, but he cannot manage. So there's always that that theme and understanding by Prabhupada that uh, I, I wasn't a good manager, but I was a perfect gentleman. <laughs> so um, I liked his uh, I liked his estimation of me. It was uh, it was savvy, <laughs> but it was. Uh, it was um, it was sweet. They, they liked me. He didn't think I. He thought that I did what I did what he wanted to my capacity, but I, I really couldn't uh, manage my way out of a paper bag. <laughs> as far as uh, some things that Prabhupada said about Guru Kul, um 
the teachers were always asking about discipline because they found it hard with all these untrained children to keep discipline. Um, he said to try to tell them Krishna stories and engage them in Krishna Leela play and they would be they would be occupied. Um, and the time would pass, they'd be happy. And academics should be restricted to just English and Sanskrit and a few studies, not much. Um, one day when he visited, he had some long, they gave him some long uh, rods and everybody gleefully held their hands forward. He said, you know, there can be punishment or they hit you in the hands. Everyone was, you know, wanted to be hit by Prabhupada. So he said, you know, we can, if you do wrong, we can hit you in the hand. Everyone, the teachers and the children were pushing forward to be hit by Prabhupada. But he said that um, the teachers should never hit the children. Um, if they do, if they do, they should be hit. Another thing was that um, should the teach should the school be a day school or should it be a boarding school? Mm. Um, that's gone down in history to be um, well in Vrindavan and Mayapur. They are now they're still. They're, they're mostly a boarding schools, but elsewhere it's it's seen to be uh, that day schools are better. And the Dal and that, that it was wrong in Dallas to have it a uh, boarding school, to to take children at such a young age and keep them under the care of such untrained teachers. It was the reason it was wrong. Um, but I, I was in favor of having it at boarding school. And uh, Mohanananda went to Prabhupada and, and he said that he, and he, he wanted it to be a day school. And Prabhupada said, with, with great trust in me, saying, whatever he says is, is right, you do what he says. So he came back just you know, I have to do what you say. But um, it didn't work out. But um, it could have worked out if, if the teachers hadn't been uh, such uh, wrongdoers. Or, as the story goes, you know, if they had, if they had been trained, if, 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 if. But, um, at least my my memory is that uh, that Prabhupada uh, had sided with me in that question in a very personal way. Prabhupada favored the boarding school because they would be with the teachers all the time, uh, getting. Uh, in a Krishna conscious atmosphere, living in the temple, and uh, learning by example of the, teach the teachers, uh, how to be devotees, they would they would go through the same temple program as the uh, as a temple devotee. Whereas if they just lived at home, uh, there, there wouldn't be the same uh, opportunity. It's like to live in the temple is better than living in, 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 in the home was the idea. How do we know after death that we'll take another body? And he said, well, the simple example Krishna gives is that in this life, we 
change from young man to older man to old man, and then we die and take another body. I said, but that doesn't prove that that we'll do it in the next life. It just proves it in this life. He says, uh, no, he says it does, just like in a dream. Uh, and um, I said, no, that's, that's just your faith. It's not, a, it's not actual proof. It's just an analogy. Uh, it's analogy it doesn't actually prove that, uh, that I'll become uh, another person in another body. You know, I just hang in there with the devil's advocate position. And then I realize, hey, I, be I better c cut this out. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to keep c keep arguing against my spiritual master. Um, this is this finally rests on faith, and uh, and he he would not stop his his with his strong arguments on. Uh, is based on, the, on Krishna and, and the sh Shastras. So I just finally would, would, would stop. I would concede, at least on that one. Because I, to this day, I, I, I think uh, it's a matter of faith that argument of uh, how do you prove that there's another life? Um, after death. How do you know you're going to wake up from the dream? At, at death, how do you know you'll, you'll wake up? Uh, the analogy off? the prophet gave was just like a dream you were saying. <laughs> Well, there are two analogies. One is that we're um, we're changing bodies. So at the end of this life, we'll change bodies again. So he kept hammering that that was proof. That yeah, that's proof. And I said, no, that's that's an analogy. Uh, it's a good analogy. But it's not proof that actually, when I die, I will take another body. He said, it is proof. And then he said, anyway, it's Krishna, it's Krishna's authority. Then that would really be the, the more, most important thing, since Krishna says so, it's, it's Krishna's authority. Then I would, then I would stop. So it's not just that it's analogy, it's Krishna's authority. Krishna says so, all the authorities say so. The soul is eternal, and after this body you take another body. Because the soul is, uh, doesn't die. Sometimes on morning and morning walks, you just, you're not just intellectual play, but you just really feel touched in your faith. Remember him saying, I, I, am, I, am, uh, I am not blind. You, you, to see God, you have to have, uh, have, to have some, somebody who's not blind. I am not blind. I can see God. You follow someone who's not blind. And we're just sloshing through the sand and made a turn and going the other way. And I just thought, wow, Prabhupada knows. He's not blind. He just said he's not blind. They're all blind. 
I know, he says, I am not blind. They're such gems, such blockbusters. Because I know I'm not blind. Was it prima facie yeah, evidence? He carries that. Someone gave me a, a DVD of Ram, about Ramdas, and they were talking about his guru, Guruji, and they showed a picture of him, and his disciples were talking about that. The, the one thing they said about him is that when you were with him, he made you feel love uh, he made you feel love for other people so but there's nothing about love of God so Prabhupada made you feel love of God and by such conviction in an argument, philosophy. Such a gigantic thing. And he was a great scholar from the, of the Vedic literature. The quality that was most meaningful to me in Prabhupada was his love. He didn't always show it because he was the general on the battlefield and didn't have time. Uh, and some of the per some persons didn't really need it. Think of a person like Tamal Krishna Maharaj. He was ready to take the battle orders and fight. Of course, he needed love too. Overt showing, but. We all needed love. And I was just almost criticizing Ram Das's guru, but for, for only apparently having that quality. But um, Prabhupada's uh, love. In, with the ability to bring us back to Godhead. Um, that's what I think he has, the, the potency to this kind of astounding love to, um, that's what we're counting on him to. As I just read on the back of one of your books, quote that he said, I can guarantee you, uh, I'll bring you back to Godhead. So why does, why does he do that on behalf of his Guru Maharaj, uh, out of love? Um, so, he has love for the cow, love for his, for all living entities, but even more for his disciples. And I think he wants us to come up to grade so that he can present us to Krishna. Please take these souls back. So I don't, I don't know how much of that I, I can claim I saw, but I have faith in it, that I did see it, and that that's what he's uh, offering us. 
That's why we're, that's the value uh, in remembering him. Um, it's so important what you're doing in any, any remembering pro, pro, uh, program. There's a cryptic note that Rupa Goswami sent to Sanatana Goswami when Sanatana was in jail. It goes like this. Where has the Ayodhya of Raghupati gone? Where has the Mathura of Krishna gone? When you are in anxiety, keep the mind steady. It's cryptic because it's hard to understand what it means. But it means that the Dhams on earth are deteriorating, even they are. Uh, Vrindavan Dham. The Dhams will always be there, but on earth they're, they're deteriorating. But we should, we should, uh, as, and, and Prabhupada, m memories can deteriorate. Uh, the, even the remembrance that he was here and what his quality was. So um, we have to do this kind of thing. Remember him and uh, speak about his qualities. Um, so that we don't forget what he is in our life. Because so that, so the importance that that I I just spoke was um, mm -hmm. of his presence that we can remember is his uh, ability to take us back to Godhead, mm -hmm. and uh, that I see as I said is his quality of uh, his power as a, as an empowered agent of Krishna, a loving agent. To do that, you go into the material world, you fit into disciplic succession, but in a very special way, and uh, go and I've been reading these uh, New York diaries and the Jaladuta diaries, go and bring all these souls back. And uh, he he's he's done it, or well, he's he's he has uh, he's done a lot of it, and a lot of it has to be done uh, by his followers. But um, by by following his 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 example. And part of it, you know, what more can we do? You know, it's, we've, we've flopped as trying to be gurus or trying to carry out any imitation of his presence, but remembrance in itself is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Just to remember how Prabhupada held a cup or mm -hmm. did this or did that is a, very, is, a, is a good thing. Asking all the devotees, what was he like? What did he do? So there's people in the future can remember that story you just told. It was it was wonderful. What did how did somebody ask Prabhupada, what did you feel when you chant? He said, I feel no fear. To, for anyone to hear that story and for them to keep it. They can they can also feel no fear. This is preaching. So I was, I was just like walking off the, the gangplank when you asked me that question. I don't know what I was going to say. I felt like it was phony, though. And I said, well, here goes. The best quality I see in Prabhupada is, and I just, just started talking without knowing what I would say. But... Um, you said love. Love. Yeah, that's what I need is his love because I need to be forgiven and by his love, his charity, his leniency and uh, 
And then I need that, we all need that, um, that actual power that he has to be uh, an empowered guru to to be the one to release it. Not just Krishna at the time of death, but uh, Prabhupada to say, what is it I, I, I make up a thing in my mind all oh, that when I die, I'll say, uh, call for Krishna. And they'll say, oh, whose disciple is he? Prabhupada. Oh, Prabhupada. Very famous guru. So ask Prabhupada, do you, do you know this disciple? Sasvarup? Well, what do you think of him? Do you think, where should he where should he go next or what what is his what is your recommendation for him? That's how it's and what is he going is he is he gonna save us all? Wonder what he was telling me that she felt that actually she had a real rev, kind of a, it was like a revelation that he's going to save every one of us at at our death. We have nothing to fear. Maybe that's true. Just have to re remember him and and love him back, like. I said, if you love, he said to me, if you love me, then I'll love you. So all his, and what by disciples, I don't only mean those who got initiated by fire, Yogi, but uh, all those who want to be his disciples. Can be his disciples. They can all be linked with him. Jai <laughs>